Now, Don, <clears throat> what always bothered me for years, if God is a God of love, doesn't he still love people in hell? Does he just stop loving them after they go to hell and says, okay, I'm not going to love you anymore? He loves them still in the sense he's doing the best he can for them. Because guess what? When a finally impenitent person at last is brought to his or her threshold of submission, that person is as close to peace, real peace, as he or she can ever come. So God is not going to exert a far greater force on them that they yes. don't need mm -hmm. to bring them to submission. Right. He'll bring the least amount of force needed, and that's his the love. Yes. That's his compassion, mm -hmm. saying, I'm, I'm not hurting you, inflicting any more stress, any more pain on than you need, yes. but I'm giving you just enough that you need to bring you to the closest state of peace that you can be. If God would set them free on a world all by themselves, what would they do? Fight each other and abuse each other, try to kill each other. Even if they had bodies that can't die, they would still end up venting their hostility and being jealous or lustful or whatever. And God is just not going to devote a, any arena, any world, for people to carry on like that forever? No. Evil has got to be incarcerated. It ultimately has got to be contained and neutralized by stress levels that are at just the right level for each person. Not, not in excess, doesn't have to be in excess. So consider, even Satan himself has, wow. a, has a threshold of submission and he will be at that point. But that threshold will be far greater probably than any human. I would think so. I would think so too. So. God prefers, even yearns, Absolutely. to bring people to himself through persuasion. Yes. But the if charisma that, of the gospel. If, if it goes from B to D and it doesn't work, mm -hmm. then he'll bring stress. The DA people or the AD yes. people, yes. he'll bring stress on them. Yes. And they too shall bow and be as close to a state of peace. And let me say something about those people at the bottom of this, up here, the C, B people, mm -hmm. the ones who respond to general revelation. You know, if they were not there as a kind of assault in the midst of human societies, a lot of human societies would just become extinct because people would kill each other off. But these people, because they've been regenerated by the Holy Spirit and are manifesting moral concern and living on a higher ethical level than the average person around them, they tend to be a restraint on the otherwise rampant evil that would just be everywhere in the tribal village or in the desert community. So uh, their presence is a mercy to other people to prevent them from killing each other off because I've lived among people where they could be taking up their bows and arrows and trying to kill each other every day and their rage would go on. The, the violence, the lust for revenge can be horrible. And a lot of these tribes, there's only just a few hundred people or a few thousand people. They've existed as separate cultures for thousands of years. By You'd think by natural processes of biological increase, there should be a million to this tribe and a million or more to that tribe, and there's only a few thousand or a few hundred. It's because they've been killing each other. The violence is horrendous. Mm. The, you the saw race. it firsthand. Yes. But in the midst of them, there would be these men of peace. And these men of peace would, to some degree, have the effect of restraining at least some of the violence that would otherwise be unchecked. That's God's love yes. to humanity. But when the gospel comes and the CB people receive that, they become more effective persuaders. They don't just quote Proverbs advocating be morality, good. be good, be nice. They have the gospel and they can plant the church. And then the number of people that are there as voices for good increases. And it means from that point on, the culture can begin to increase its number. The Sawi people that I lived among for 15 years out in the jungles of Papua, numbered only, we estimated 2,700 people in 1962. Since they received the gospel beginning the next year in 1963, and now 70% of them profess faith. Guess what? Their numbers have increased. The population is now over 6,000. Thousands of years <laughs> to reach a population of 2,700 and just another 30 years to more than double that population. 
The arrival of the gospel makes a difference. The grace of God makes a big difference. Okay, Don. <clears throat> if every knee bows, every tongue confesses, if there's repentance in hell, how are we defining saved? They're not saved. They're not saved. What does, what does salvation mean? Salvation means that you seek to be reconciled from God and on the basis of Christ's sacrifice, he reconciles you. You are a citizen of his kingdom. And when you die, that sinful nature that you inherited from the first father, Adam, which is like a goiter growing on, on one side of your soul, so to speak, at the moment of death, God Oof. removes that. You, with your new nature that you received through the Holy Spirit, are the part of you that goes into the presence of God. So from then on, you are no longer beset by a part of your own being that's constantly open to temptation. You're free from that. You still have a free will. But having come through the chasm that, and the pit and the darkness of evil, there's no way you're ever going to re return to it. You are forever. So the key is the regeneration of our spirit, yes. that we have become a new creation in Christ. And yes. that's what it truly means to be saved. Those in hell do not have that. It's mm -hmm. still their old nature, but they've been brought to a position of repentance mm -hmm. without the regeneration of their spirit. Yes. Don, let me, we're almost at our time to conclude everything, but let me ask you one last question. How is a person's threshold of submission determined? By the person himself. Elaborate. A person is born into this world. He grows up with parents who teach him certain things. He goes to a school, is educated, and is learning more things in the school and in the community. And in the midst of all these uh, things he's learning in his daily contacts and experiences, he's forming an attitude. He recognizes that he has an opportunity to take advantage of someone, to make someone else look bad by lying about them. And he sees an opportunity to steal something. And if this person then steals or tells a lie or abuses other people, his conscience bothers him. He either yields to his conscience or he resists. He decides, I'm just not going to feel sorry for this. And if I have a chance to steal something else, I'll steal it too. And I'm not going to be afraid of anything. And so he sets his pattern to continue to defy ethics, to defy morality, to defy law. Don, just to help me out and maybe a question that our audiences might have. Could there ever be a person in hell, maybe they were a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Hindu, or whatever, non-Christian mm -hmm. in whatever culture, who would shake their fist at God and say, God, if I'd have had Don Richardson's life, if I'd have had Bob Shogren's life, if I'd have been brought up in that Christian context, in that Christian home, I would have been a Christian too. This isn't fair. Mm -hmm. God can easily say to that person, well, guess what? I checked out all those possibilities. I mean, you had to be born of certain parents. You had to be born in a certain place of time. That was a given. But from that moment on, if I had arranged this for you, here's how you would have rejected the persuasion. If I'd done this, this, that, or the other thing, you would have rejected all. Maybe God can even give the man in his own mind a, a visual replay. He would see himself in that situation where he thought he would act differently acting wrongly there as well. So in, and, in some ways, the computer scan, as you say, the, the omniscient computer scan is kept on record. Perhaps that is. I mean, we don't have a scripture right. for it. But it is sort of implied by Romans chapter 3, verse 19, part B, where the apostle Paul said that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. That implies that any excuse anyone might try to offer will be countered with evidence by God. People will be able to see, actually, there was nothing that God could have arranged for them that would have persuaded them, and that's why they are where they are. Mm -hmm. Don, we're at the end of our focus, and this focus on the free will of man and the sovereignty of God, not yes. the free will of man versus the sovereignty of God. As if one, it had to be one against the other, but they're both paradoxically consistent the free will of man and the sovereignty of God. Yes. And you've given us the answer 
to the woman who said, was it Pharaoh or was it God? You did that in the concrete analogy. Review it for us one last time. Yes, the final question was, was the capacity of the cement to harden itself primary and my decision to cause the hardening by mixing the ingredients, ingredients secondary to that consideration or was it the opposite? In other words, was it the Lord who knew Pharaoh was going to, the Lord arranged the circumstances and Pharaoh hardened his heart or was it Pharaoh hardening his heart and God arranging the circumstances, which so was that, primary. So that he would harden his heart. So that he would harden his heart. And my answer was, the propensity of that solution of cement dust, water, sand and gravel to harden and become concrete was primary. Because I wouldn't have bothered mixing the ingredients unless I foreknew that that would happen. Because I wanted the hardening to happen, I mixed the ingredients. But my decision to mix the ingredients and cause the hardening was secondary to the propensity of the cement to harden itself. And so with us as people, God foresees whether we have by free will given ourselves a propensity to reject persuasions and trample truth underfoot, or whether we of our own free will have set ourselves to be open to persuasions and to respond to them. On the basis of God's, this, the fact that our setting ourselves one way or the other is primary, God secondarily arranges for known effective persuasions, puts us in an encompassing context of them that directs us the way he wants us to go. But he does not put his omnipotent finger inside our spirits and force us to respond. That would be a violation of free will, which would be contrary to the whole purpose of creation because God wants love and love has to have that free will component or it isn't really love. So it's primarily Pharaoh, secondarily God. Uh, yes. God, for knowing that Pharaoh would harden his heart if bombarded with unwelcome persuasions like the miraculous plagues, decided, all right, that's, I know he'll do that and I'm going to cause him to do it because I'm going to bombard him with things he will not welcome, he, things that will antagonize him and make him angry, make him harden his heart because it's part of my purpose. I wanted to go into the record of scripture that final impenitence is a real factor on the human scene. And people may not believe that there's such a thing as final impenitence unless I use this man to demonstrate that it is real. But he still loves Pharaoh. But he still loves Pharaoh according to what we said earlier. And the stress being exerted on Pharaoh at this very moment is keeping him as close to a state of peace as, as he, he can, can possibly, possibly come be. As a finally impenitent person. So he loves the Pharaoh, but he hardened his heart. Yes. Now, some might say that this free will diminishes the greatness of God. What would you say to that? Well, actually, a God who is so sovereign that he can grant free will to several billion people in this planet and allow them to exercise it and still overrule all the consequences and bring the history of this world to its God-appointed end is a really sovereign God. That so it enhances. It enhances our concept of God's sovereignty. And uh, God is up to the task. He's able. He's capable. He doesn't shrink away from it. He created the universe knowing that he would face this test and that he would be the winner. Mm. Amen. So let's review your definition of God's sovereignty. I'll read it. God is working to bring about the maximum amount of good for the greatest number of people through the most efficient means for his greater glory. God is so sovereign that he can fill an entire planet with billions of people possessing genuine free will and most of them exercising free will in rebellion against him and still overrule all the consequences by bringing human history to its God-appointed end, the revelation of his glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Don, in light of man having a free will, in light of God drawing them to himself, wooing them by foreknown effectual persuasions, arranging the carousel whatever way he wants, knowing how we respond, how should we pray for unbelieving friends? We should pray that any people in our sphere of influence whom God foreknows are potentially penitent will receive as early as possible in their lives 
the for known effect of persuasions, and we should ask God if there's anything that I, as one of the citizens of your kingdom, can do to be part of that persuasion, here I am. Let me speak your word. Let me show the kindness. Let me be the friend that persuades, that draws. Use me as part of your drawing, Lord, that you foreknow will be effective. And Lord, let me go to an unreached people. Yes, let me go out into the world, cross a frontier so that the Jobs and Melchizedeks that are struggling with nothing more than nice proverbs to be an influence for good in their cultures will be able to have the gospel of Jesus Christ added to what they've already learned so that with the whole counsel of God, they can be effective witnesses for God's glory in the midst of their cultures and the church may be planted there. Mm. And many of the people in that middle sector of the line will be added to the body of Christ and the bride of Christ and share God's eternal kingdom with us forever. So in living for the glory of God, Father, I'll do whatever you want me to do to be a part of that persuasion to bring about the glory of God yes. in their lives that they would respond. How should we pray for our believing friends, those who do know the Lord? Pray that they will see that they are responsible to be available to God as part of his context of persuasions. Often it's a godly person, a friend, that draws more effectively than something else. We should live in such a way as to undo the stereotypes of Christians that are, the media is propagating in the world so that when someone encounters us, he'll say, oh, there's a Christian that's different from what I heard on N NBC or whatever. I, I think I kind of like this one. I want to find out if there's more like him. They might eventually say, I want to be one like him. So that's what we should urge our friends. And we should also, by means of teaching like this, encourage people who are in doubt. Is God really merciful? Mm. Is the gospel really the only way of salvation? Can people find redemption by good works? If they're doubting whether the sacrifice of Christ is really the only means whereby God can truly forgive the guilty, this kind of teaching I think will help to confirm, to put the, the, the cement in between the bricks and make the wall firm, the wall of faith. Mm. Amen. Don, thank you so much. We've come to the end of our time. It has been such an honor to sit here and go through the teaching with you a fifth time. And hey, I encourage all of you, I did not get this on my first time through. It has taken me four or five times studying this in depth to fully own it and to go through it for you and the listening audience. I encourage you to go through this uh, material four, five, six times to fully grasp it so you can apply it to your lives and understand it. And teach it to others. And teach it to others. That's certainly when you really begin to learn it. You're in a series titled Deep, based on Daniel chapter 2, verse 22. We've just finished the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. Our next one is going to be Who Wins in the End? Are there going to be more people in heaven or more people in hell and how can you back either one up scripturally? Well, Don, again, thank you. It's been a blessing, and we look forward to seeing you in the next time. Thank you, Bob, for inviting me to share with you on these important topics. Amen.